When I was a young boy, I was fascinated by the adventures of the famous oceanographer Jacques Cousteau. So much so that I would read anything that I could find about oceans, lakes, streams, ecology in general. And I would tell anyone that would listen, I will be an ecologist just like Jacques Cousteau. And then we moved from rural coastal Florida to East Dallas. And suddenly everything that I thought was natural and normal had disappeared. I no longer understood the world around me or most of the people in it. In short, my sense of self had crumbled. But I remember my response to this spiritual environmental crisis was to double down on my commitment to become an ecologist. I read even more about ecology. I took the extra classes in high school. And I knew that to be an ecologist meant going to college. And that was not common among our people then. To go to college, I would play football on a scholarship for a year. I worked as a bartender, a cook, and a janitor, and I worked in farm and construction labor. And I always thought that all of those things were simply what I needed to do to manifest my dream to be an ecologist. And that was true, but it was much more than that. By giving myself the resources that I needed and the education that I needed to become an ecologist, that is to learn how to save nature, I was actually rebuilding my sense of self, something that I would later refer to as my dignity. Dignity is how we feel about ourselves, how we think others feel about us, about our ability to care for ourselves and care for others, as well as our connection with nature. Simply walking through a park, hearing children play, birds singing, seeing trees, improves our well-being. The need for a connection with nature is in our very genes. It is a large part of who we are. And when we give ourselves the opportunity to be in nature, we're giving ourselves the opportunity to experience that we are a part of something much larger and a part of something that is infinitely important. As an ecologist, I witnessed the awesome beauty of nature and some of the greatest atrocities committed against her. And I would wonder, why do these experiences stir me so completely, commit me so comprehensively to do what I can to protect nature? And I would also wonder, why would anyone want to harm nature, want to harm the very beauty that we all share? So I'd worked for about 25 years in various fields of environmental science and ecology when I came to a point and realized that as much as I love ecology, it's a means, not an end. Something was missing. Something much larger needed to be done. And I also realized that I had been asking this question all along. Why? Why do we do what we do to ourselves in nature? And I knew that the work that I was doing could never answer that question. So in that moment of spiritual environmental crisis, I remembered having read somewhere that when you're at a fork in the road and you know that the decision that you must make is a very important one, stop and ask yourself, what would you do no matter time or cost if you could do anything? And suddenly all these visions, all these uh, memories came back of, of the dreams of being an ecologist, about the hard work to become an ecologist, and the work that I did as an ecologist. But that question also brought back my love of elephants. I'd loved elephants my entire life, read almost as much about them as ecology. So one story would stick with me. It was that of a matriarch during one of the worst droughts in Africa's history where she led the entire herd hundreds of miles across the desert into a land that they'd never been and brought them to water. Now it was theorized that the matriarch's ancestors had passed down a story with directions of a place far away that she could take the herd should she need to give them water. I had always held elephants in the highest regard, considering them to be the most magnificent and dignified of creatures. And in that time of reflection, it occurred to me that the way they live is a model for us all. And yet, throughout their range, every day, they experience the horrors of habitat loss and poaching. Why? And then this realization came to me 
is I felt my connection with nature much more strongly through the elephants. Then the question came, who or what will I become if now that I know I do nothing? Save elephants, I said. Save elephants. This is that something larger that you must do, that's something that was missing that you must do. Save elephants. So with a lot of hard work and the remarkable help of Dr. Christy Waves and Kashmir Akakti, we co-founded a conservation initiative for the Asian elephant, SIPE. We're now in our 23rd year. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. While we were creating SIFI, I was also working at the University of South Florida as an urban sustainability researcher. And in that work, I noticed that no matter where construction or redevelopment was taking place under the guise of sustainability, it was really nothing more than gentrification. <coughs> the old homes in which families and individuals of mixed in income and occupation live with large yards and big trees for the kids to play in were swept away, replaced with zero lot line structures in which only the privileged could live. And I wondered, why do we think this is sustainable, creating something where nature cannot live, nor can most people? So I took the question to a colleague, Dr. Fenda Akiwumi. She's a social and environmental geographer at USF. And she said, you're absolutely right, Ron. It isn't sustainable. It can never be sustainable because the people are ignored. They're simply swept from their homes and denied the dignity of being part of the decision that would create a better way of living. After that conversation, I continued my research, part of which led to the creation of the five facets of sustainability model that you see here, at the heart of which is human dignity. Now, while we all understand that we must have water, food, energy, and commerce for our survival, it's the provision of these for ourselves and for others that is the very heart of who we are, our dignity. I'd been working with five facets and uh, letting it guide my research and teaching for a year or so when one morning I received a call from Dr. Williams. He was calling from one of the worst Asian elephant and rhino poaching incidences in history. The poachers, boys and young men, had been arrested and would soon spend the remainder of their lives in an Assamese prison. Not something that I would wish on anyone. Dr. Williams was distraught and angry and rightfully so. He shouted over the phone, why did they do this? Why did they think they could get away with this? What were they thinking, Ron, they've ruined their lives forever. And I, I did not have an answer for him then, but I do now. The boys and young men had been convinced by the poaching overlords that if they did their terrible bidding, they would be able to lift themselves up in their community, raise their stature among their people, in other words, bolster their dignity. And then Dr. Williams said calmly, Ron, I'm convinced that if we're going to be successful at saving endangered species, that this will come from 5% ecology and 95% psychology. I wasn't sure that I understood what he said. I said, Christy, what are you saying? And he said, if we're going to be successful, 5% ecology, 95% psychology. He was right. I said, Christy, you're absolutely right. After that conversation, I made two of the most important decisions that I've made in my life. The first was that I would change Syfy's approach to elephant conservation that we would be a, a human-centered elephant conservation organization. What I mean by this is that every time we began something on behalf of the elephants, we'd first start with attending to the dignity of the people with whom they share habitat. Why? Because clearly we've lost our way to a sustainable human ecology if we think that slaughtering elephants and rhinos is the best way to bolster our dignity. The second decision that I made was to earn a doctorate in psychology. Why? Psychology is the science of why. And in my opinion, psychology is the science of human dignity. One example. 
In the 1990s, Dr. Williams conducted research in a region far northeast India known as the Garo Hills. His conclusion was that the Garo Hills might be among the most biodiverse places on Earth. And he said that, and 10 years later, with environmental destruction taking place throughout the Garo Hills, Kashmir, Dr. Kotke, repeated that study. This time, she went into the Garo Hills and recruited boys and young men to build her field team. She trained them on how to collect samples, maintain the transects, take notes, pitch camp and cook, and she paid them a decent wage. Boys and men would come back to their villages, to their families and friends, and with pride, they would talk about what they were doing, the work that they had been doing, what they were learning, and the value of the information that we're collecting on behalf of the Garo people. How different was their experience than that of the boys and young men caught slaughtering elephants and rhinos? During my doctoral program, I created a field, sustainability psychology. It has seven tenets two of which are important for our discussion today. The future is nothing more or less than a decision today and any action for sustainability that does not first attend to human dignity ultimately will not be successful. Dr. Kotke's approach honored the people there, honored their dignity, gave them the place, the meaning to do the work that they needed to be done to save their land, their culture and their future. Not long after, Dr. Kotke's conclusion was that the Garo Hills are, in fact, among the most biodiverse places on Earth. Not long after her study, Garo people came to her and they said, the government is telling us that we do not have a right to live on this land, that they are going to move us from our land, place us in cinder block villages, and strip mine the entire region for coal. They couldn't believe it, but it was true. They've been told that. They came to Kashmir because they knew she, they could trust her. They knew that she knew that their very nature was at stake. Not long after that meeting, we met with 300 Garo people, representatives of all the villages, the colleges, universities, towns, cities, businesses. And we asked them, tell us how you would want to save your land, your culture, and your future. And they did, and we listened. Now, you might imagine that I have a lot of images from India, but not one of them is as meaningful as this one of Mr. P.R. Marak, head of the forest office in Garo Hills and 300 Garo people voting unanimously to allow us to pursue a UNESCO World Heritage Site that would save their land or culture and their future in perpetuity. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> So I shared two stories with you, one of that of boys and young men slaughtering elephants and rhinos in the hopes of bolstering their dignity. The other, boys and young men learning to be field scientists and collecting the information necessary to save their land, their culture, and their future. The decisions that we make in pursuit of dignity make all the difference. It is in the protection of nature that we find the promise of dignity. Start there. Start with dignity in and for nature, and you will find sustainability to be a remarkable outcome. Thank you. <laughs>